our, ne our next and last stop for now in our tour of the properties of continuous functions is going to be to try to study what are called the extremal properties of continuous functions. We're going to get there by looking at how continuous functions interact with one last topological property of sets, and that is the property of compactness. How do continuous functions interact with compact sets? Once we establish that general topological result, we're going to be able to prove another important theorem from calculus. I said another important theorem from calculus. Whoa, whoa, what's that? What's that? Oh, sorry. Uh, I didn't hear you. I was just solving some optimization problems for my calculus. Are you, are you okay? You sound a little, I don't know, different. Oh, 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 right. Sorry. Oh, there we go. Now, if you don't mind, my problem set is due at 11.59 p.m. tonight, so... Optimization problems, huh? What, like, find the global maximum and the global minimum, those kinds of problems? Yep. I love it. See, this is why every educated person should learn calculus. Look, how else are you going to know how to maximize your business's profits or minimize the time it takes your dog to fetch a frisbee in the lake without calculus? Good luck! Well, what if I told you that optimization is not always possible, Wait, what? even with calculus. And even when global maximum and minimum points exist, they don't exist because of calculus. The function doesn't even have to have a derivative anywhere. But, but my calculus book says but that... whatever. You're just going to ignore me anyway. So, you know, good luck on your problem set and everything. I hope none of your problems are unsolvable Well, if they are, I'm going to blame you. Now, if you'll excuse me. Huh. <sighs> So let's figure out how it is continuous functions interact with compact sets. And immediately after that, we should be able to derive a result from calculus that ought to make even our friend the calculus enjoyer. Uh, I won't say happy, because I don't think he's really ever happy. Um, but at least be satisfying. Mm, recognizable. Let's get started. So compactness was this property of sets that we introduced as a way to help us avoid what I called the local to global heartbreak. The phenomenon in which we take an infinite collection of truths and try to glue them together into a single truth, we want that to be something we can do and not something that might fail when we pass from the finite case to the infinite case. And we had these two very different ways of understanding what can make a set compact. The first was called the cover finiteness property. The second was called the subsequential completeness property. And in the beginning, it wasn't clear that those had anything to do with one another. Um, but then we learned that they were actually one in the same property, and that also for subsets of the real numbers, that there was a much simpler characterization. So the cover finite property of a set says that every open cover of K has a finite subcover, that there is no way for me to contain K as a subset of the union of a whole bunch of open sets unless only finitely many of those open sets can do the same job of covering K with their union. That's the cover finiteness property. The second property was subsequential completeness, which says that every sequence of points in K, every sequence at all, has some subsequence that not only is a convergent subsequence, but its limit is a point of K. Right, so there's sort of two surprises in that. No matter what sequence of points you give me in a compact set, that sequence will have a convergent subsequence. And moreover, the limit of that convergent subsequence will be a point from my original set. So there's no way to make a, uh, a sequence of points inside of a compact set have a limit outside of that set, for example. But then we found out that for subsets of the real numbers, there was a much simpler characterization that being compact for a subset of the real numbers in the standard topology defined by the metric that's given by the absolute value of the difference between two real numbers. So in the usual way that we speak about the standard real line, compactness is the same thing as being closed and bounded. So these are the three different faces that compactness wears as far as subsets of the real numbers go. And so our question is, how do continuous functions interact with compact sets? Well, since compactness can be defined purely in terms of open sets and set theoretic definitions, that makes it something topological. And we also know how continuous functions interact with open sets. Continuity means that the inverse images of open sets remain open. So we might be led to conjecture that because the inverse images of open sets are open, and I can define compactness in terms of open sets, maybe it's true that the inverse image of a compact set is a compact set. Let's investigate that. Let's suppose that I draw in a continuous function that kind of looks like this. Maybe it's, I don't know, a cosine function or something like that. So something that remains kind of bounded between an upper and a lower limit over the entire real line. 
and let me pick a compact subset of the codomain, which is a closed and bounded interval that uh, sort of goes above the top and below the bottom of the largest and smallest value of my function. If I pick that as my subset of the codomain, what would the inverse image be under this continuous function? Well, that inverse image is going to be the set of all x values for which f of x is in this closed bounded interval. But that is true of every single x value on the real line for this example. And so since the entire real line is not compact as a subset of the real numbers, I don't think we can in general conclude that if you give me a compact subset of the codomain of a continuous function, that the inverse image of that set is compact. No, no, not necessarily true. And so just as we did with connectedness a couple of videos ago, we should probably try to turn this around and say, well, what about the forward image? Might it be true that the forward image of a compact subset of the domain of a continuous function must be a compact subset of the range? Let's test that out. So let's start with a compact subset of the codomain of my function. I'm going to call it k. And suppose I have some continuous function, and I look at the image of that set under the continuous function. So here's my image as a subset of the range of this function, call it f of k. And so the question is, if you tell me that k is a compact set, can I guarantee for you that f of k, its image, is a compact set? Well, we have a lot of different characterizations to choose from. I want to choose one that's not just going to let me prove this for functions on the real numbers. I want to prove this in a more general setting as well. So I'm going to choose the cover finiteness property, just because it's the one that kind of directly relates to open sets. And we know something very specific about how continuous functions interact with open sets. Before I embark on this argument, I would recommend to you that if you don't like this argument based on continuous functions and open sets and open covers and finite subcovers, if you don't like it, you should be able to go back through and redo this argument using the subsequential completeness criterion for compactness. All you would have to do is go back a few videos and remind yourself of how continuous functions interact not with open sets, but with convergent sequences. We had a criterion called subsequential or sequential uh, continuity back then that would help you to do that alternative proof. But for the sake of this video, we're going to do the argument that uses cover finiteness as our characterization of what it means for a set to be compact. So, my question is, can I guarantee, based on knowing that k is a compact subset of the domain of this function and that my function is continuous, can I guarantee that f of k is compact? And if I'm following the cover finiteness criterion, what I'm trying to show is, is it true that every open cover of f of k has a finite subcover, a finite subcollection of the open cover that can still include f of k in its union? So to make this argument, let's just imagine that we begin with some arbitrarily chosen open cover of f of k. So you give me u1, u2, u3, u4, dot, 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 dot. Maybe this is an infinite collection. Maybe this is so badly of an infinite collection that we can't even index it by the natural numbers or the rational numbers or even the real numbers. It could be this large, like massively uncountably infinite open cover. It doesn't really matter, right? So you give me some gigantic bucket of open sets. And all I know is that the union of all those open sets contains f of k as a subset. So that's all I know is that each one of those sets is open and that f of k is a subset of their union. But that already gives me a lot. Because knowing that each one of these sets in my open cover is an open set tells me that if I find their inverse images under the continuous function f, that those inverse images will be open subsets of the domain of my function. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take all the openness that we get in my open cover up here in the codomain, and I'm just going to pull it down to the domain by taking the inverse images of those sets. So to u1, we will associate this inverse image f inverse of u1. Um, to u2, we'll associate f inverse of u2, et cetera, et cetera. And so I get a bunch of open subsets of the domain of my function in this way. Just for the sake of notation, let me use the, the name v1 to uh, speak of the inverse image of u1, uh, and v2 for the inverse image of u2, and so forth, just to make my life a little bit easier. Now, what do we know about these v's, these blue sets, that are the inverse images with the orange sets? Well, because the orange sets were open, the u's were open, and my function f is a continuous function, that means that the inverse images of these sets under the function f are also open sets. That is, after all, what continuity tells us, guarantees for us. So each one of these v sub i's is an open subset of the domain of my function. Moreover, because all of my u's covered the set f of k, because f of k was contained in the union of all of my u's, that guarantees for me that all of the points in k are going to be contained in one or more of the v's. Why is that the case? Well, 
f of k being a subset of the union of the uis means that any y value, if you like, um, which belongs to f of k, is going to belong to at least one of these orange u sets. But then that must mean that in the inverse image of that u set, we're going to find an element of k. And therefore, every element of k is going to belong to at least one of the v sets, which are the inverse images of the u sets. So k is contained in a union of a whole bunch of open subsets of the domain that we're calling the v sub i's. And since those are open, that makes the v sub i's an open cover of the set k. And now here is where we can use the fact that we have assumed that k is a compact set. Since k is a compact set, every open cover of k possesses a finite subcover. There are finitely many of these v sub i's that are capable of including k as a subset of their union. This is where compactness actually comes in for us. So there does exist, by compactness of k, a finite subcover. So k can be contained in the union of some finite collection v sub i1 up through v sub i n of my v sets as subsets of the domain. And then all I have to do is take that finite collection of blue v sets that are covering my k and just pick that same collection, finite collection, of orange sets, and that collection will cover f of k. So all of the u's that have the same indices as the finite subcollection of the v's, which is capable of covering k, that collection of the u's is going to cover f of k. And since this open cover was chosen for us arbitrarily by the whims of the universe, that means that every open cover of f of k possesses a finite subcover. And therefore, we have proven that if f is a continuous function on a domain E, and if a is a compact subset of the domain E, then the image f of a is a compact set. So continuous functions take compact subsets of their domain and transform them into compact subsets of their range right, by the forward image of a continuous function. So this is a really important observation. And just like with our corresponding observation on connected sets a couple of videos ago, this result is going to allow us to immediately deduce one more important result, a theorem that you made use of in calculus, maybe without even knowing that it was a calculus result, and probably without even knowing that the result might not actually have anything to do with calculus at all. So my little colloquy with my friend, the calculus enjoyer, at the beginning of this video, where I said that optimization is not really a calculus problem, it doesn't really require us to take derivatives, and it might not always be possible, that's what we're going to use this result to get to in the next video. So stick around.